Hi, I'm Belinda Moore and I'm about to talk about membership and surf lifesaving. Okay, good morning everybody. So I've been working in membership for almost 25 years and yes, I'm considerably older than I look. And, and you know, one of the things I love about membership is it is a fantastic tool. It's a fantastic tool for organisations to achieve amazing things. Now, it is only a tool. If your organisation is true to its purpose and is actually powerfully achieving tangible outcomes, then the process of recruiting and retaining members becomes a whole lot easier. And I've worked with thousands and thousands of member-based organisations over the last 25 years. And over the course of this session and, and one after lunch, I'm going to try and condense that learning and share that with you. Now, first of all, as Ashley so cover, covered so well already today, the landscape that we're operating in is changing phenomenally. And we can't do anything to change the fact that everything is changing. But we need to recognise the fact that nowadays we carry around this. 15 years ago, look what we would have had to carry around to achieve the same outcomes. So how could it be possible that if we still operate now in the same way we did then, that we can achieve the same or better outcomes? We can't. If the landscape around us is changing, then we need to change as well to adapt. We need to innovate and we need to be aware of what is happening so that we can stand up and truly realise the purpose to the full extent possible. Now, as I say, I've worked with thousands of organisations, and one of the consistent factors that I've seen is that the most successful organisations, the most successful, whether it's clubs, whether it's associations or unions, political parties, whatever it happens to be, they're the ones that create <coughs> communities of peoples, that bring tribes together. When I first started out in <laughs> working in clubs and associations back in uh, the early 90s, we used to be, if we were working in the organisation, we thought we were doing a jo good job if we kept our members up to date and we would engage with our members. And, you know, that was all well and good back then, but things have changed. People expect more. And nowadays, it's the ones who facilitate not just engagement between the club and the members, but facilitate engagement between the members. Now, this becomes challenging when you're working with an, working with an organisation like yourselves, because as your CEO, Stephen, so, uh, pointed out so well this morning that you're trying to bring the tribe together. But each club that you have is a tribe, and within that tribe, there are many tribes sitting beneath that, and you need to help build a strong community. But one of the challenges that I've seen when it comes to this is that there is a very, very fine line between a community and a clique. Now, Oh, I don't have it back. Yes. So what you need to do is create a pathway. Now let me tell you a story to illustrate this. Due to my friendship with someone who sits on the board of a club based in Queensland, I introduced a new member to them. Now I knew that this person would be an amazing fit for that organisation because much like myself, she's a compulsive volunteer and doesn't know the word no. So a few weeks after she joined, they had their AGM dinner, which you know, effectively it's a bribe to get enough people together so you've got a quorum so you can get through all the boring stuff. We all know how it works. Now both the friend of mine who sits on the board and the friend of mine who is, I'd introduced as a member attended that event. And a couple of days later, I caught up with a friend of mine who sat on the board. And I said, oh, how was the event? And she went, oh my gosh, it was the best Thing ever. We played this hilarious joke on the CEO. I got a chance to catch up with everyone. I hadn't seen them for years, some of these people. And, you know, we drank till the wee hours in the morning and I haven't done that since the kids were born and before do we pay for that. But she went on and on and I started thinking, ah, crap, I've missed the only decent one in history. <laughs> but then, then I caught up with the friend of mine who I'd introduced as a member to that club. <coughs> And I said, so, I hear I missed a brilliant night. She said, no, you didn't. Oh, and nothing more to do with those people. She was so angry, like deeply, deeply angry. She was never going to attend anything that club did again. And I asked her, I said, well, what happened? 
because I know that board, I know the staff, I know the members of that club, they're awesome people who are doing some amazing things. And she said, well, everybody knew everybody, they just talked to each other all night, no one talked to me, I had no clue what was going on, it was all in jokes. And there was only one other new member who came along and they sat me with him thinking, oh, maybe they wanted to stick us both together for some reason, but he was a complete sleaze bag, wouldn't take F off for an answer. <laughs> And I left before dessert. Now, imagine, imagine that happening in your organisation, how mortifying. And yet, something so simply fixed. If that club had just had some kind of a member volunteer position, where the only thing that this member volunteer had to do was to make sure that the new members had a good time and were filled in on the backstories and maybe introduced to someone other than the sleaze bag, that person now would probably be sitting on their board. But they didn't. And recruiting and retaining members, doing it well, you've got to pay attention to this level of detail. You've got to create pathways for people to feel like they're welcome to be part of your community. It's kind of like, imagine it's a little bit like uh, dating, when they don't mind if you're seeing a whole lot of people. And I always do make that analogy as well, that if once a member joins, it's kind of like getting married. So if you wouldn't do it to your husband, you don't do it to your members. Doesn't work in reverse, just letting you know. <laughs> but it is important to realise that the decision to join an organisation is not the same as the decision to belong. The decision to join is a transactional, oh, what the hell, I'll give it a go. The decision to belong is an emotional decision to be a part of something bigger than yourself. The decision to join is often made at the point that someone says, so do you want to, do you want to give it a go? Yeah, sure. But that decision to belong, to be a part of something that's got a purpose and has a meaning, as Surf Life Saving does, you're a phenomenal organisation. But that decision to actually be a part, often that's made quite some time after they've joined. In your organisation, do you create these pathways to engage people of all ages and make them feel welcome. And one of the best ways to do that is ad hoc volunteering. You guys rely, rely on volunteers. Most of you people here are here today are volunteers. But when it comes to volunteering, if when somebody joins your organisation, the first thing you do is offer them some kind of long-term permanent role, well, that's just mean. <laughs> particularly if you're offering to have them come on your board, because the research is pretty clear. It's only a small proportion of your membership that is ever going to want to or be able to participate in long-term roles. And it's kind of like asking someone to volunteer in a permanent role is kind of like going up and saying, hey, how you doing? Want to get married? Mm. Now, at this point, you should run because my husband's six foot three. But, but this is just it. We go up and just because we're ready for someone to join or we're ready for someone to volunteer, we ask them, we ask them for a very permanent commitment. But you can't do that. You've got to give it, you know, you've got to lift a bit of knee but not give away the whole shebang when it comes to volunteering. <laughs> so it's easy to do that in a skirt. But it is when you're getting people on board as volunteering, give them small opportunities to engage, one-off opportunities to see how awesome you are, to get to know other people in the club and to understand that, yes, you're their tribe and you're someone that they can get behind. Give them the chance to become emotionally involved with what it is that you have to offer. Now, one of the challenges that you've got is generational shifts have fundamentally shifted the way that membership operates. And there is so much research on this that makes it very clear. The people most likely to join, the most likely to renew, and the most likely to proactively vo volunteer or get involved in their clubs are the boomers or older. <coughs> now these people from 2011, they've started to retire. This means by when it gets to sort of 2029, the majority of people who are sitting in our clubs, who are volunteering with us, who are members, who are on our boards, are going to be Gen X or younger. And they are very different in the way that they engage with <coughs> member-based organisations. You look at something as simple as going to an event. If you're a baby boomer or older, you're like, well, I'm a member. Of course I'm going to go to the event. It's, it's what you do. But when you look at the younger generation, say you look at your Gen Y or even your Gen Alphas, and Zs, they're like, well, how's my input going to make a difference? 
And people often make the mistake, they say, well, these younger people, they're just about what's in it for them. Well, yes and no. Everybody at the start of a relationship with a club is about what's in it for me because you're not yet aware of that emotional reason to belong. But they're also looking at how is my specific input going to make a tangible difference to the outcomes of this event or what is happening. So in order to engage people with events, the way we communicate with them has got to change. But you know what the big barrier to this happening is? And I've seen this, I've worked in thousands of organisations and I see it time and time again. The products, the services, the events, the publications and the decision making processes of almost every club is entirely geared to the preferences of the boomers or older. And you know what, I can understand why. Imagine you're building a house, it's your house, you can have 16 bathrooms, 12 kitchens and a single bedroom. But then you go try sell that house and that's what ha is happening now. The boomers and older built the clubs that we have today and they're real comfortable in. A boomer joins a club and they're like, oh, this feels good. But someone younger coming into these organisations doesn't necessarily have that same feeling. And sometimes, and sometimes quite often you'll see that very, even though the people who are in the leadership of clubs are very, very well intentioned, they don't understand that they're unconsciously alienating these younger people who otherwise would be involved. Does that make sense? And you can see that. I often see it particularly within the governance of clubs. When there's, and there's not that realisation that everybody wants to help and everybody wants to achieve good things, but sometimes that paradigm, that context that we're operating from is different. And so this means that you need to have a fresh look at what you're doing and say, are we truly inclusive of people, of all the different tribes that we have? I mean, it's as simple. I remember back when I started out in my first association in the early 90s and we used to tell our members, oh, we keep you up to date. And we did. Every quarter we sent them a magazine and once a year we sent them a renewal notice. You go to the average gym <coughs> I, and say, I'm going to keep you up to date with a magazine once a quarter, they will laugh me out of the room. When they talk about being kept up to date, they want me on Twitter going, right, I'm walking into the minister's office. I'm sitting down on the chair. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> Like they want the blow by blow of what's going on. And so if you're communicating with them, you've got to realise that they need that kind of engagement in the ways that they want to engage because they do approach membership different. They want to be part of vibrant tribes that are powerfully achieving something purposeful. And that's why your organisation provides a wonderful platform for that because you look at the research on these younger generations coming through they are very philanthropically inclined. They want to do good. They want to be personally involved in doing that good. They want it to be very direct. Your organisation provides amazing pathways through for that. But they, and the interesting thing is though, they're a bit different too. They're not just loyal to the organisation, because they're actually not as loyal to organisations as, as people used to be. They're loyal to people and something to watch out for when you are engaging with younger people is that they become very loyal to the people they perceive to be their leaders. Now that may not necessarily be somebody in a leadership role. And that means that should that person leave, their hold into the club can be lost as well. So if you are engaging with younger people, try to disperse the relationships so that they have good, powerful relationships with more than just one person in the club. Now, and I'm going through what normally is a one-day course very, very fast. But <laughs> when you're talking about delivery, uh, about getting people engaged, think about it as well. People engage with you for a reason. Now, every different tribe within your group, whether it's parents, whether it's your nippers, whether it's your teens or your, your senior groups, they engage for different reasons. And you need to understand why so you know what buttons to hit when you're talking to them about getting involved. I've got four children. And, you know... For me, time is a big issue, but I will make the time if I know that putting my children into something is going to help them to learn leadership skills, help them to be better people, help them to be a more successful life. There is a very specific set of buttons that I hold that if you push, I'll be there saying, take my money, take my time. That same button is not the same that's going to get an older teen involved or a senior person involved. So you need to understand your market and why. 
Do people want to get in there? Why would you, younger people, get involved in your governance processes in your club? Well, is it altruism that they want to be part of it and make a difference? Is it because they want to learn a useful new set of skills that they may not have been able to gain somewhere else? There's lots of different reasons and you need to know what those reasons are. And the other thing is when you are communicating with this group, it's important to remember, because this is the fundamental um, mistake that a lot of people make. They think good communication is sending an email. Yeah, yeah, we've told the members, we sent them an email. I'm sorry, <laughs> can I just tell you now, good communication is not that. Good communication is thinking, what action do we want to inspire? And then what do I need to do? What do I need to say to inspire that action? And what are the different channels that I need to use to create that outcome? Good communication is not just sending an email, it's about inspiring action. That's why I don't really give a crap about open rates when I'm sending communications. I care about whether or not my communication achieved the outcome I wanted. If I want someone to get off their bum and go and do something and they didn't do it, then I failed, even if my open rate was 100%. And you know what, don't be afraid to be humorous, to be a bit innovative with what you're doing. You have so many different channels available to you through which you can engage with people. And what I'd like to do now is I'd like to just share with you a very quick video. Now, I know this isn't a sporting example, but I love this campaign because this was a way that a very small, poorly funded local group was able to achieve significant cut through and international profile for what they were doing through doing more than just sending an email. There once was a library, a beautiful, busy, award-winning library. Unfortunately, times were hard. The city of Troy, Michigan no longer had enough money for its library, so it scheduled a vote asking the townspeople to approve a small tax increase. This angered an anti-tax group known as the Tea Party. Well organized and well funded, they started posting vote no signs, mailing flyers, and making noise. They dominated the conversation, changing the topic from library, books, and reading to taxes, taxes, taxes. With no money and an election less than a month away, the library needed help. They needed something attention-getting, audacious, maybe even vile. So we decided to form a group of our own and started planting signs around town that said, vote to close the library August 2nd, book burning party August 5th. The idea of book burning is bad enough, but gleefully making it a party, well, that angered people enough to send them to our Facebook page. You people are sick. This is disgusting. Reject the wackos. Vote yes. But we didn't stop there. We created videos. Imagine this times 200,000. How cool is that? Posted on Twitter. The Troy Library might be short on money, but it has books to burn. Created items for sale. A book bag. How ironic. We placed newspaper ads, created check-ins, posted flyers, and lined up entertainment. You guys are booking a band? People became enraged. Why would you burn books, idiots? This is horrible. Cheap imbeciles. What the f*** is this world coming we to? We should burn your signs instead. Complete and total this idiots. Is really this is really just Jerks. They posted their own links, shared with friends, debated the merits of libraries and the audacity of burning books. The conversation spread from Facebook to city council meetings, from newspapers to TV. It grew from local to national, even international news. Once it reached a fevered pitch, we revealed the true intent of our campaign. A vote against the library is like a vote to burn books. And people started posting, tweeting, and reporting all over again. In the end, we had changed the conversation completely, from taxes, 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 to library, library, library. And on August 2nd, the yes voters, voters who don't normally turn out to vote, turned out at levels 342% greater than projected. And the library won by a landslide. The town's library, its beautiful, award-winning library, had been saved. Not every story at the library has a happy ending. Fortunately, this one did. I love that campaign because when this came out, they could have just sent an email. Do you think it would have been as effective? So if you're serious about communicating and engaging with people, think about who you're communicating with. What motivates them to get involved? 
What are the media channels that they want? And then think about what kind of relationship with, do they have with you currently? Because you may be communicating with a passionate member. You with a passionate member, you don't have to give any sort of context or background. They're already there mentally and present. But what if they're a never even heard of you never member? Depending on where someone is with that relationship continuum, there's a different level of communication that's involved because people might be aware of the brand Surf Life Saving. It's a strong brand, it's a trusted brand, but when it actually gets down into the detail, not everybody knows exactly what it is you do and how it's a pathway for them to make a positive difference in their community. You don't need to tell the passionate members about that, they already know, but somebody back on this continuum of not even heard of you or unengaged they might need to understand that. There's context setting required. And do you know what? There's some interesting research that's been done. If you want to really maximise your recruitment, nurture your passionate members. Because it's a really interesting thing. The more passionate members that you have, the more members you'll have. Now, the last thing I want to touch on, you guys got a great strategy. I was really impressed with watching that this morning. And I've seen a lot of great strategies. Actually, I've seen quite a few. I wouldn't say a lot. Um, but one of the things that I've noticed that's a deal breaker for strategies is culture. Culture will eat strategy for breakfast every single day of the week. So that is why part of your strategy and to support that strategy means maximising your culture, creating something that's inclusive, including something that's welcoming that people passionately want to be a part of. And remembering the fact that the membership department is not the whole organisation. But the whole organisation is the membership department. You're all working together to achieve amazing outcomes. But my final advice to you here is this. You need to be innovative. You need to think differently. And don't assume, just because you've always done something one way, that that is the right way to do it. Because there is always a better way to get the job done. And in fact, I'm about to prove that to you. Who here knows how to ride a bike? Awesome, I'm glad to see that many hands. I would have been a bit worried otherwise. So I've always thought that is the way to go faster on a bike would be to roll the pedals, turn the pedals, whatever it is you do. You can tell I'm not sporty. <laughs> so let me share with you somebody who thought about how to do things better. And in this video, figure out who do you want to be? Do you want to be this guy? The innovator? Do you want to be the people at the back who see this innovation and go, I'm still going to keep doing things the way I've always done them because it works for me? Do you want to be these people he's coming up on who can see the innovator coming up behind them and going, oh yeah, but I'll keep doing things this way. I'm just going to do what I've been doing already, but I'm going to do it harder. If I pedal harder, I'll be able to beat him. Let's see. It's coming up there. Or do you, would you like to be the chap on the scooter? as to who you want to be but can I suggest think differently take a fresh look at everything and I guarantee you'll move forward fast thank you very much